Alrighty, I think it's time to start, so let's give it a go. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, very happy here to be here uh, in Sydney. First time for me. Uh, first time in NDC Sydney. First time in Australia and uh, New Zealand nearby, right? Uh, I'm going to talk about async uh, demystified today. And um, here's something that you should expect uh, from, uh, from this talk. Uh, I'm going to go through the history of async uh, patterns in .NET uh, and then uh, look at the kind of history and evolution of task and async await, uh, including value tasks, some kind of gachas, uh, you know, what's kind of behind the scenes. Uh, I tr you know, tried this talk in some uh, couple of uh, local user groups and uh, one feedback was that the first half uh, is kind of boring for some people. However, other people find it useful, so I still keep it in. So I apologize if you're in the first group. Uh, you might be bored for uh, you know first half. Uh, and just that you know, kind of a little bit context on this talk. Uh, this is not something I came up you know uh, you know entirely on my own. Uh, this is actually a rehash of something that uh, the the father and uh, author of the, um, you know, of this, uh, of this async await and all the asynchronous things, Stephen Taub did internally. And when I heard that, uh, I was like, oh my gosh, this thing has to get out. Like, this is gold. Uh, that, that finally made me kind of understand uh, a little bit more and deep, deeper appreciate the async await stuff. So this is what I'm going to present over here. Uh, and hopefully, you're going to get the same value that I did uh, from that. So let's start with history. A uh, long, long time ago, uh, in .NET Framework 1.0 and 1.1, which is, wow, uh, 16 years, 18 years ago, that's, or something like that, that's pretty, that's pretty far, uh, far out, uh, we invented something called APM. Uh, uh, APM patterns stands for Asynchronous Programming Model. And uh, what was it, really? Uh, it was a thing where we had an iAsync result uh, interface which had a couple of things on it. Uh, one was uh, the is completed, is completed uh, synchronously, those are booleans. Uh, it had some object, uh, async state, uh, usually custom, uh, and weight handle for the async, uh, weight handle, like the async weight handle, uh, which usually was like, you know, manual reset event or auto reset event. And, um, you know, this thing was, you know, cool back then. Uh, it was, you know, uh, spread across BCL, uh, the core effects. Uh, and uh, the typical function you would see in, uh, in BCL was something like this. Like there was like begin foo, uh, which takes callback, uh, it takes the state. And then uh, end foo, uh, which would take the iAsync result that the begin foo created or kind of returned. Um, the usage of the APIs, uh, like there were basically two ways how to use it. Either you would wait for the callback, you would call the uh, you know, begin foo, you would wait for the callback to be called, and then inside you would call the end foo. Or the other option that you had is actually to directly call the end foo and block. That thing would block until that the asynchronous thing ended. So you had two ways how to use it. Um, let me, uh, let's actually, let's look at that, how it looks in code. So synchronous call would look like this. You have a foo method. Uh, the, uh, the asynchronous alternative, and many functions in BCL actually have both synchronous and asynchronous stuff, would be begin foo and end foo uh, couple. Uh, and to achieve exactly the same thing as calling the synchronous, uh, synchronous foo using the asynchronous thing, you would do this. You would call end foo on the begin foo and just pass now for callback, now for object state. Uh, magic happens, basically the same thing. Um, now, the, to take actually advantage of the asynchronous nature, obviously you would not do that like that. Why? Why would you do the synchronous when you can do asynchronous? The whole, pi the whole point of asynchronous is actually to be asynchronous. Uh, to take the advantage, uh, you would call the begin foo and you would create their lambda um, uh, callback, uh, and inside you would basically, as I said, call the end foo on the uh, on the iasync result that was created uh, from the from begin foo, and you would get the value uh, value out of that and do some stuff. Anyway, fairly easy pattern, you know, sounds good, right? Now, this works fine when you have one single operation. It breaks down badly uh, when you need something more complicated, especially where, for example, you're passing things between streams or something like that. You need usually like more than one operation. It's rare that you do like, hey, one async operation, I'm done. It's like, you know, copy, I don't know, 10 kilobytes uh, buffers across streams or something like that until end. Uh, and it's usually a loop. So how would that look like in a loop? Uh, imagine that really, I just said, you're copying a stream to stream. So normal code would look something like this, uh, the synchronous version. Um, you would 
read from the input uh, into a buffer. You would get information how much bytes were uh, read, and usually zero is the you know notification, hey, you're done, get away. Uh, and inside, you would just like take that buffer and pass it somewhere else. Imagine that this is, for example, taking I don't know, uh, disk. Uh, for, you know, you're reading from disk uh, one stream, and you're sending it to network, or uh, the other opposite, like you're reading from network, saving it to disk, or saving to memory to process it a little bit farther. Uh, so fairly simple. How would it look like, uh, you know, in um, uh, in APM in the asynchronous way? Because doing that synchronously kind of sucks. Uh, so you would have the begin read. That's what we've seen before. Uh, you would pass the, uh, you know, pass the callback, and the callback, the first thing it would do, it would call, uh, call the end read on that. Once you have the end read from the input, what do you want to do with that? You want to call the write. Uh, to call the write, you want to do it asynchronously as well. So you would begin write uh, on the input. That's a bug in the code. Sorry for that. Uh, you would, uh, you know, invoke the begin write. Uh, again, in the, in the callback of the write, you would call end write, and what do you want to do after? So that's basically the one iteration, that's the single operation. After that, you want to go on. So you do begin read, inside end of read, then do you begin write, and again, 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 and you probably, you know, do computer science for a while, you know that it doesn't scale, um, you, know, it, you know, it does not work at all. So the thing that actually you need to do is to turn this into loop. And uh, I didn't try it myself, but apparently it's extremely long and tricky, and very few people do get it right. So uh, that's kind of that's kind of sucks. Um, and on top of that, like this is kind of the happy path. No, well, not happy path. It's actually the non-happy path when everything is asynchronous. Uh, but in practice, oftentimes you get actually synchronous. Com you know, not oftentimes, but in certain scenarios, it's quite common that you get synchronous completion of the asynchronous tasks. Uh, so what do you do with that? That actually complicates stuff even more. I'm gonna look at it in the next slide. So it's completed synchronously. Uh, you know, when we, uh, you know. Why would you kind of want to deal with that? First of all, you want to deal with that for uh, performance reasons. Because if you have the data available, instead of like, you know, spanning another task, like scheduling it on thread pool and that stuff, if you have the stuff over there, just like go and deal with that at the moment. Uh, so the good code would look actually something like this. Uh, inside, uh, inside the callback, you would first think, you would say like, hey, did it complete synchronously? And if not, then you would do the asynchronous path. Otherwise, you will uh, fall back and do something different right behind. Which means that you would have, you know, uh, have if check like, hey, if it is completed synchronously, do do synchronous path. Uh, actually, there's quite a few BCL uh, functions, uh, or you know, especially around networking and other stuff uh, inside BCL actually have exactly this pattern. Now, uh, this is uh, not that great because it has like several problems. First of all, the, war, uh, the loop that I said before in just the synchronous, uh, asynchronous way was complicated. This makes it even like, you know another level more complicated. So that's a no-go. Uh, you know, uh, and overall, actually, you know, people would, they, would people rather do it than um, doing something like this. They said, like, you know what, like, let's, let me just like, put everything on thread pool, and that's going to be easy. You know, that's kind of asynchronous as well. And uh, you know, let me not do the uh, performance impro improvements and everything. So that kind of sucked. Um, now, um, when you look at that, um, uh, the kind of the this is actually another problem uh, on top of what I said. And the problem is uh, that imagine that you have something like memory stream when you're passing things around and it's actually, uh, um, you know, the, the basically in memory stream, typically the data is available right away. Uh, so what's gonna happen is that if you have this loop, this beautiful loop, well, very complicated, right? You have all the if checks and stuff. You take the, uh, take the completed synchronously path all the time uh, because you, you know, the memory, is just available. Maybe you do, you know, compression in memory or something like that, right? Uh, what is what's gonna happen? You're gonna have actually in this loop, you're gonna uh, you're gonna get actually um, recursive callbacks, uh, you know, recursive calls because you're not just looping, but whenever you need to call the next step, you're gonna call it yourself. And after roughly ten thousand, uh, you know, recursive calls, you're gonna stack overflow. So that's yet another thing to kind of worry about and something that kind of complicated things. So overall. You know, uh, it was co it's complicated, and uh, you know, even in BCL, uh, we kind of have lots of wrappers around these things. There's in networking something called lazy async result in the implementation inside, and there's lots of specializations. And 
overall very complicated kind of rocket science code and uh, actually I had the opportunity to run into that uh, probably last year in networking I was like oh my gosh what is this doing and we had actually security bugs around that because buffer management because you don't know when things come back and what you can release and just like pure nightmare anyway um, one day uh, a little bit later in .NET Framework 2.0 we decided like let's do something better or well I should say better we probably strive for do something better but we did something different we did event-based uh, asynchronous pattern, EAP. Um, and it was very similar in its nature uh, as the previous, the AM, APM, uh, except that it used events. So over here, you would kind of like hook up the event uh, with like sender and uh, event arcs, and life was fairly beautiful. Now, um, uh, you know, it's a very straightforward idea, and uh, the, the handler would be kind of involved uh, generally by thread pool, uh, the callback when it was completed. Like, you know, cool, right? Uh, the problem is that it did not solve actually the multiple calls problems or loops. Uh, so the stuff that I showed before, uh, it has exactly the same uh, problems. Apparently, we decided that uh, we decided we realized that uh, right after shipping or very quickly that yeah, okay, we tried to improve things, but we did not actually help with the key problems. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting experiment, but didn't really go uh, anywhere. In BCL, it's actually used at a couple of uh, classes, uh, especially around networking, like SMTP client, TCP client, and background worker uh, around thread pool and that stuff. So it is some use, but uh, overall, it didn't kind of kick off uh, much. We didn't kind of push for it either. Uh, it was, you know, interesting experiment, but one important thing that came out of that was actually the execution context, which you might have heard about. Um, you know, it's something, imagine that it's something like, you know, uh, async local. Uh, so something that flows with your asynchronous, uh, uh, you know, flow uh, through the threads, uh, no matter where you kind of uh, execute. So you have a place where, where, where to kind of put things uh, in. And actually, the async local is built on top of that uh, in the later future uh, versions. So even though it's kind of like, Mm, you know, sucks that we introduced something that was not useful. Uh, at least kind of some uh, side effects were useful, eventually. So let's move to, you know, next step, and that eventually, uh, afterwards, uh, task came around. And um, it was uh, in actually .NET Framework 4.0, uh, which again is probably a few years. Uh, and uh, interestingly, that it was created as a part of MSR, which is Microsoft Research. Uh, and it was strictly about parallel computing. It, was, it has nothing to do uh, with I.O. and this stuff. Like, originally, it was really for you know, how to do efficiently on some unified way, some divide and conquer. So imagine quicksort, right? You know, we learn it at schools. Uh, if you went to school, uh, if you're not self-taught and that stuff, where you kind of do quicksort, you're going to make the pivot. You say left side, sort me left side, right side, do it recursively, divide, conquer. When you have results, you're going to kind of merge it together. Uh, so that's what the goal was. Now, um, you know, we got there. Uh, it kind of shaped the task. And on honestly, like, you know, how it shaped the task, how it created that, that stayed until today. And uh, it was an interesting, uh, you know, uh, note from uh, Stephen that he made uh, is that, you know, you know, the task is pretty good. You know, it's lightweight, nice, you know, easy to think about. Uh, uh, it's roughly 90% of the things in there are right. And 10% until today still they game up at night even after 10 years. So I uh, would love to change it, but obviously, uh, compatibility, everything, people depend on that, not going to happen. Sorry. Um, so uh, what is that task? Uh, if you didn't, um, didn't kind of uh, run into that before, it really truly represents something general, general work. It doesn't care if it's compute, if it's I.O. It's not tied to thread pool, which is the beautiful thing. I mean, almost not tied to thread pool. Uh, we're going to get to that. Um, you know, it's really uh, about, um, you know, not execute, uh, it's not tied to the execution. It just represents the, wor uh, the work. You can call it uh, in other languages like promise, future, or other terminology, but it's basically the same thing. You can shove results into it, you can, it can be completed, and it can wake up somebody who's waiting on the task. That's roughly what it does. So the, we have two versions, task and task of T. One is generic, uh, basically what, uh, what the return operation, uh, return value is. Uh, that's the T. If it's white, then you have the non-generic uh, part task. Uh, and uh, what it contains, as I said, like first of all, it returns the value uh, T in case of uh, task of T. For task, it's white, so there's nothing. Um, it has some state related to synchronization, and as well as some uh, state related to, to callback that you're going to have to call, uh, or somebody has to call. Now, 
that's tasks that just represent things. There's a beautiful thing called a uh, task completion source, which not many people run into uh, if you're consumers of the tasks only. And the task completion source is something that actually, or actually coming back first to task, task is actually something that, you know, you consume, you use it. You kind of hook up to that and you say like, you know, hey, when you're done, you know, call me, or if you're done already, just call me right now. But you basically hook up yourself to something. You, if you have a task in hand, or somebody gave you a task, you're not given the opportunity to actually do something about it, like change its state. That is the role of the task completion source. Uh, so as I said, like, you know, the task is something that you can tell it like, you know, hey, I have call back, you know, when you're done, or, you know, even right now, when you're ready, uh, and it's completed, call me back. Uh, the other thing that is inside is that, hey, uh, or you can use it for, it's like, you know, I want to block until it's done. So like, you know, no, no, not giving callback, but kind of wait on you. And the other thing, you cannot really complete it directly by the user. Now, um, that's a good thing. There's this task completion source, which is actually wrapper around task, uh, which is interesting. It calls internal method, methods on the task itself uh, to actually change its states and that stuff. But the beauty on, of the task uh, completion source, it is something that if you're a producer of, uh, of such work, like for example, networking or whatever, you know, IO, uh, you don't give it away. Because you give it only to trusted people or trusted callers that you know are not gonna mess up with your workflow. Because imagine, you know, uh, you're reading something from network uh, or something like that, and uh, somebody suddenly decides like, yep, you're done. Like, well, I'm not done, I, you know, uh, so, you know, you want to be in charge of when things are done, when things are, uh, you know, when you're ready to kind of move and make it completed. Um, so the task completion so, uh, source kind of like changes, uh, you know, under the hood uh, the task. There are three ways, which is either you set result, which means that, hey, if you complete it, I don't know, you read some data from some stream or something, you set result. Or there was an exception happening during the time, maybe lost connection or something, uh, you can set exception. Or it has been canceled from the user. In that case, you say, hey, it's canceled, so we're done, and there's going to be some canceled uh, exception later on. Uh, right, let's move on, on the consumption. So I said the task, how it's consumed. Um, you know, we have a task tree, and uh, you know, either you can wait on it, so you do t.wait. Uh, that usually creates the manual reset event, uh, and it will be signaled uh, later with, uh, you know, if, if you call the, the one of the three methods uh, or task completion source, if it calls the set, uh, set result, set exception, or set canceled. Uh, or you can do the, you know, non-blocking way and say like, you know, hey, here's my callback, you know, uh, when you're done with it, you know, just call me back. Uh, the beautiful thing on that, like you can call it multiple times, or it doesn't have to be only you. There can be multiple consumers of the same time, uh, task who kind of hook up to that and say like, you know, hey, please wake me up uh, or call me back uh, when you're done. So this is how you can uh, hook up into it. And um, the interesting thing that it does not guarantee, you know, order of execution, so it doesn't matter in which order you're going to hook up the callbacks. Uh, and it's always asynchronous. So it doesn't have any, you know, synchronous way, except there's an overload with tax execution option, and you can do done synchronously, but we're not gonna get into that. And uh, if you look at this, like, you know, why is this so much better or, uh, than what we talked at the beginning, the APM? The key difference is that, uh, you know, in the APM, in the iAsync result, in the original, uh, you know, asynchronous pattern, we didn't have any shared implementation. Over here, you actually, you can share lots of code, because uh, the continuation is not specific to the caller. You don't have to pass the delegate at the creation time. So you can have like generic code, and then whoever needs to kind of be woken up later on is gonna hook up to that. That's kind of like very small thing, but actually it uh, enabled lots of interesting things. And uh, we will see later in the talk that actually that's what the async await uses exactly, you know, behind the hood. The compiler actually hooks up to these tasks to be called uh, back into some generated code and executes your meta the method on your behalf. Uh, you know, small thing, but change the world. Uh, now, let's talk about the thing that keeps Stephen Taub up in night. Uh, you know, we did this function task.run, which is convenient method. Uh, everyone loves it. Uh, the trouble is that it mixed up things. It basically, this is tie to thread pool, because what it does, it actually creates the task, runs on that thread pool, and does that. If you remember, as I said, task is in general like representation of work. It doesn't care about thread pool or anything, except this one. And um, on top of that, to kind of implement that, 
um, you, know, uh, you know, this is how the task run looks like. We actually added field to the task just to support this, which kind of sucks. So we kind of made it larger. Um, and uh, actually, I don't know if we fixed it, but uh, I'm gonna uh, see actually why we think it's bad. Uh, it, as I said, it queues the work on the thread pool. Um, you know, some thread will grab it, execute whatever thing, and then mark the task completed. So it's a convenient method. Uh, obviously, people love it uh, because it's useful. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, you know, it complicated things because it kind of suddenly everyone thinks like, oh, task.run, it creates the threads, like, and their mindset is that, hey, tasks are about threads, which is actually not the fact. So we kind of complicated for people to understand it, and on top of that, uh, kind of messed up a little bit with our implementation. So um, what if we said like, hey, you know, why don't we do, do it simpler? Uh, there's actually a way how to implement task.run, uh, you know, with existing things that I just showed you, and as well nicely demonstrates how you would use tasks and task completion source actually. So what do you do first? We say, you know, inside, you get like, hey, I'm supposed to execute this delegate f and I'm supposed to return some task of t after that. So we would create the task completion source because you're the person who will generate uh, the work. You don't put it away. You would then queue some work on the, uh, on the thread pool that would do what? That would execute exactly what you were told to execute. Uh, and once you're done, you have some result, you will set it on the task completion source. Uh, and then eventually, at the end, uh, you will return the task out of the task completion source. Uh, which I might, because it's basically, as I said before, it's the wrapper around task, the task completion source, and calls the internal methods, right? Uh, it's obviously in reality a little bit more complicated. You have some try catch, exceptions are a thing, you know, and you do something else with them. Uh, in this case, the set exception. And there would be probably, you know, it's optional, the, the cancellation, uh, you know, uh, stuff. You probably don't have to listen to that if, and in this case, you don't even want to. Now, um, the task that you return out of this can be awaited on. And if you look at that, it's not that complicated. It's actually fairly simple. Uh, yet, we unfortunately messed up our implementation. So, yep, mistakes have been made. Um, let's go to async await, so a bit, you know, positive uh, note. So that thing came out in .NET Framework 4.5, uh, which is basically the next larger version after the 4.0 uh, where the task came in. Uh, you will see the pattern that we introduce pieces and then the next release finally starts building on them in a meaningful way, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, and um, we're going to look at some kind of example of asynchronous call. Uh, so imagine that you have methods like get data. By the way, the async is, you, if you did the async in .NET, you probably know that the async suffix is typically say like, hey, I'm a task-based uh, kind of like, you know, um, what is it, um, you know, convention, basically, for the methods. So imagine that you have get data, put data, let's say it does something across network or I.O. or something like that, You're just like throwing people, uh, throwing data here and there, not people, that would be bad. Um, you know, uh, now, um, how would it look like? Uh, you would first call the get task, the get data async, then you would hook up a continuation uh, on that and say like, you know, hey, when you call me back, which means when the thing is done, I want to put that into some, uh, you know, async, uh, into, you know, put the data on the other stream, on the other side, uh, and um, let's just for the fun print out we're done after we're done, you know, something like that. Obviously, you don't want to write code like this. So how would this code, which is exactly the same, look like with the, you know, async await? Um, you would start the same, you know, get data async, you get task of t, and then we would just await the t, await the task you would get a result, which is the a dot result, basically, uh, in the code above. Uh, you would put, you would take the result and do something with them, like, you know, on the other side, uh, put data async. Uh, you will get another task, and what would you do on that? You would await it. Uh, that thing returns void, if you notice, the put, because it doesn't have any information, just like information like, hey, I'm done. And after you're done, you can go and write line your I'm done. Fairly simple. And actually, if you look at that, uh, you know, the code above is roughly what the compiler generates for you, uh, you know, the C-sharp compiler. Now, it's a little bit hand-waving because it's a little bit uh, more complicated from the perspective that uh, compiler doesn't know specifically about task, even, even that has small asterisks, I'm gonna get to that, uh, but it looks for so-called evator pattern. Um, so, um, and task is one of the things that is evator, which was actually very smart that we kind of, it's kind of basically uh, a duck typing. Um, you know, uh, if anything looks like task, it can treat it this way. Uh, we're gonna get to what, the, what does it mean, the evator pattern in there, and uh, 
it actually enabled us, us, as you will see later on, to ship similar things which can deliver even more, things that we couldn't imagine at the time we shipped this thing. So we made it you know, generalized enough uh, instead of shipping interfaces and stuff that kind of uh, you know, uh, bound you into certain things, how you have to behave. Uh, and thanks to the Evator pattern, actually, it improved us to, uh, to you know, innovate later on even more. So let's look at the Evator pattern. Uh, how would this thing that we've seen in the code before look like? So if you evade T and you get a result out of it, it's actually translated uh, by compiler into something like this. You get T dot get evader, which doesn't, you know, you don't know what the, you know, even compiler doesn't know what it is. The only thing that it kind of needs is kind of few methods in there. One of them uh, is, is completed. And that thing has to return bool or a uh, bool. Uh, and if it's not complicated, you do something. We're going to get to that later. Uh, and if it is complicated, uh, then you call the get result. The methods in bold are exactly those uh, things that compiler looks for uh, in the task like or in the evator pattern. Um, and the not is completed thing is a little bit more uh, complicated. We're gonna get to that uh, a little bit later, actually on the next slide. Uh, and basically, what it has to do is someone has to uh, it has to hook up some code that you know. It, uh, because if it's not complete, it means that it's running asynchronously. You don't want to block on that place. The whole point of the async is that you don't block uh, parts, but you need to somehow hook it up and make sure that next time that the, when the thing is completed, you're going to go and resume the execution in this method after, the, uh, after this. And then uh, I'm not going to go in this talk about details, but you can totally imagine that you're evading multiple things in a method, right? You know, you have large method, you evade this, evade that, evade that, and like so uh, all that thing can be multiple, uh, you know, multiple things uh, in your method. So the complicated thing inside, I just, you know, make sure that we're going to go and dig into that. So this is the same code, or piece of it, uh, that the not is completed, and then the get result that we're going to kind of return. So um, you know, let's look into deeper into that. So first of all, all this is part of a method which is called move next. Um, and um, the move next uh, method is basically, it's a state machine. Uh, so you have state and uh, um, you, when you kind of like get into the not, not as completed, you say like, you know, hey, I am in this state, return, and when you come back, you will know that, hey, this is the state you have been in, let me, I know where to continue next. So the state machine has some states, for example, state zero, and this is one of the probably only or few uh, valid uses of go to. Otherwise, don't use it, please. Uh, but you know, in the state uh, zero, you go to label zero, label one. Uh, what do you do? And is completed. It's some, you know, it's somewhere in the middle. So let's say it's you know state 42 because it's a good number, right? As we all know. Um, when you know you set it, and then you call another thing on the evator pattern. That's the uncompleted. You basically tell the evator, like you know, which is the task-like thingy, like, hey, when you're done, please call the move next. And in, in between, uh, or in, in the meantime, you saved in your st uh, in your state uh, in the uh, in your state where you should resume. And uh, not surprisingly, at the beginning, you're gonna check, like, hey, if I'm the state 42, next time you call me, I need to resume where I was before. So right after the not is completed. So that's how it's done. Now, um, the uncomplete is a little bit more, uh, you know, um, complicated signature. We're not gonna go into those details. And uh, let's look a little bit deeper into how does the state machine actually look like. So imagine that you have a code like this. You read something from a user, you know, X. Um, you then, um, you know, independently evade for something from network or whatever, you know, some async. And then you want to right line something like, hey, I'm done. And by the way, the X was uh, something important. As you can see, you know, uh, or as we, as we talked about, the evade will basically you know, interrupt, the, you know, there's going to be the move next, and there's going to be kind of interrupted call. And uh, when we come back, uh, you know, the question is like, you know, how does the X actually survive the evade, right? You know, because uh, it's different calls. Uh, so uh, there's going to be state machine created by the compiler on your behalf. Let's say this is method foo, so there's going to be method foo state machine. It's going to have the move next, something that we have seen before. Uh, it's going to have the locals, so the X from this code will be one of the locals that's going to be captured in that state machine. Uh, it's going to have parameters of the method because they need to survive uh, usually, uh, and it's going to have the you know evator and as well state. Uh, evator is basically. Um, you know, generated you know dynamically based on what, whatever it returns, so it can be different type all, uh, all the time. Now, the this trick is similar to you know if you've seen lambdas and how they kind of do the closure and capture all your locals. This is state machine is basically the same thing. It's not rocket science. Now, 
interestingly, and like not surprisingly, compiler obviously uh, optimizes um, optimizes things. So if the X would not uh, would not kind of cross the await boundaries, it would not be uh, put inside the state machine because there's no point. Why would you store locals which you will not need later? So you know it's trying to be nice to you uh, to everyone. And uh, another thing you probably notice that it's struct. Uh, it's struct from perf reasons, but uh, if you have structs, uh, it kind of sucks in debug uh, because finding them and you know, uh, you know, on the heap and whatnot is ex ex extremely difficult. You cannot enumerate like what's in flight if you have a dump and that stuff. So actually, in debug mode, uh, which is interesting, uh, this is a class uh, which obviously then allocates. I'm gonna get to performance and that stuff. Uh, and the, actually, the reason why it is struct now. Imagine that. Um, you have something like buffered stream. So um, you read a buffer, 10K, and then you know, the, you know, and the user, wh whoever calls you, you're just gonna return pieces. And let's say the user is like calling and reading always one byte, for example. Uh, and you read the 10K, right? So then per each call, if it would be, uh, you, know, um, you know, we're gonna see that later, if it would be actually, uh, you know, class, you would allocate state machine uh, per, each, uh, per each of these calls, of the read. Uh, now, if it's struct and if it completes synchronously because it's buffered, because you read the 10K, you have it in memory, you just can immediately return. With the struct, you can avoid actually these allocations because everything is on the stack. So that's the that's one kind of key motivation for the performance why it's a struct, but in, deb uh, in debug, it's class for uh, debuggability. Alrighty, uh, let's move on and let's actually look at example of such state machine. So. Over here, you know, uh, method foo uh, takes timeout, and inside we just call something task delay timeout and await on it. So, classic, you know, wait wait for so many seconds. Very simple thing. Uh, how would the state machine look like? Um, so it would have the parameter timeout. We talked about that. Uh, it would have locals if there were any crossing the await boundaries. There are none, so just a comment. Uh, it will have the move next method, as we said. It will have it will have the state and the awaiter. Uh, information, which is actually task evader uh, type, and the, what the compiler generates on top of that, instead of the you know async foo, it generates a real public foo uh, which is not async. Uh, and inside, what you do first thing, you go and allocate the state machine. It's a struct, so boom, default, beautiful. Uh, you will you got the timeout, uh, so you store it in the state machine. You initialize the state uh, and you move next because the, all the logic is actually inside the move next method. And then you return something. We're gonna get uh, you know it needs to be a task. We know that uh, it's a little bit more complicated. We're gonna uh, you know expand on that in the next slide. So how would this work? Uh, we're gonna keep the foo method and uh, and the state machine. And as you have seen, the foo method is now a little bit larger, uh, missing the bottom curly braces. Sorry for that. Uh, but it's basically, you know, same thing that we saw in the, uh, on the on the slide before. Not much changed. So, what we will have here, uh, actually, uh, yeah, I messed up the slide that it doesn't show in the right order. Sorry for that. Uh, but the timeout state and move next was from the previous slide. And the thing actually we need to do this is in the wrong order. Oh my goodness. Sorry. So on the state machine, we would have the task completion source. On top of that, so that's the last uh, field I added, and it actually it's something that uh, we move uh, in the move next. Uh, we would set result on. Uh, if you remember again, like you know, to return the task, the task completion source is the thing that kind of generates and completes the task, right? Uh, and uh, uh, even though that this is a field over here, it's logically there. It's actually more complicated. I'm gonna get to that a little bit later. Uh, and in the foo machine, uh, the first thing that's new is that we allocate the task completion source in there. And then uh, we're gonna return the task, which is inside the task completion source. Uh, you know, fairly, fairly straightforward. Now, there are two problems here. Uh, problem number one, uh, performance. Uh, there are two allocations in this code. One is the task completion source, and the second is, is actually the task inside the task completion source. So per each call, you're gonna do two allocations. Which, you know, imagine again the buffered stream, you know, when you have the 10K and you call it one byte each, like you allocate per each call to two objects, uh, you know, kinda, kinda sucks. Uh, the other problematic thing is that, as I said, the compiler tries to not know anything about task. It's a white lie, a little bit, but almost anything. Um, so it has the evator pattern, and the same way, 
uh, you know, it tries to not understand that there's a task completion source because that's tied to really specifically to task. So instead of these, you know, task completion sources, what we have is, you know, builder pattern. Uh, so instead of the new of task completion source, uh, you're gonna find the right builder, which is some magic I'm gonna describe, and then call create on that. The huge advantage of that, that thing, because you're just looking for create method and whatnot of the right builder, can return a structure. Which means, again, if you complete synchronously, you don't have to allocate. So with that, you're gonna get rid of the allocation of the task completion source, which is awesome. And obviously, like if you have the builder like that, instead of storing the TCS, you're gonna store the builder, and uh, the builder inside has like another, you know, the, uh, the pattern is task, and that's something that you would return in the code above. So a little bit generalized, but you know, not a uh, super huge thing. Uh, we actually, um, we actually uh, have this exactly thing for the value task. That's the specific uh, method builder I put there in there. And how the C Sharp compiler finds for your thing, what's your right builder? It actually looks for, I think, oh, everywhere, for an uh, uh, attribute on uh, types, which basically tell the compiler, like, I'm builder for that thingy over there. So um, it, it, no, it can stitch just through kind of attributes all these things without knowing anything about task and task completion source. All is kind of task-like, which is kind of cool. Uh, just FYI, internally we have actually, in, you know, structs for the async task method builder, which is for the task. We really have that method, uh, method builder. Uh, we have the async task method builder of T for the, you know, generic case, and as well for the async void method builder. Um, and uh, that's probably as much as I can say on this slide. Uh, so we, with this builder, we enable the option, especially for value task, to you know, eliminate one allocation uh, in there per call, which is cool. Still, there's this task in there. So what do we do about that? Um, one thing that actually you can do, uh, first of all, the builder, you know, the, you know, for example, for the value task, can reuse known tasks in this case. Uh, that's what we kind of enable. Um, for example, uh, there can be task.complete, and there is task.completed task, which just represents that, hey, I, I've been, I'm done. I don't return anything void, but you know, I'm done. Uh, why would you create instance of that per each, uh, you know, per each call? As soon as you have that case, you can always return this thing, uh, and uh, you can reuse that. Um, we have actually for Boolean, there are only two options. There's like, can have value true or false. Uh, you know, C++, that, that can have like any value in there, which is good. Uh, so that enables us to, uh, to actually optimize for uh, you know, having two values, and based on that, we return, we return the predefined values. Uh, we have, like, for integers, like there's lots of numbers, but uh, from unknown reasons to me, we have specific values for minus one and eight inclusive. Uh, you know, probably we did some research somewhere uh, that it's kind of useful. Uh, zero to eight is probably like the typical size that returns in something and minus one like error, I don't know. But anyway, we have those things buffered. Uh, and uh, another thing actually, we, you can, you know, the, the builder can as, as well cache uh, the last completed one. Which imagine that it's a memory stream, that you read chunks of memory. Uh, you're somebody who reads 4K or somebody else reads 8K, but then you usually do the loop. Uh, so each call, typically, except the last one when you, you know, read the rest or whatever is remaining, is the same, so you can reuse that, uh, reuse that thing. So that's cool. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it does not work, for example, for SSL stream. SSL stream is this thing uh, when you do SSL because, you know, or HTTP, you have the headers, which you kind of uh, uh, do, uh, you kind of, um, sorry, uh, you, uh, you will kind of uh, encode, encrypt, and then the body, uh, and they are usually different sizes. So uh, for something like that, we would have to invent that you have last two, two last completed things and alternate between them because again, typically they will be probably you know similar or same size. And you know that's how you avoid you know they will not be the numbers between minus one and eight, but something larger. Uh, another thing actually that you know peripheral improvements that we can look at is that you know the size of this thing is actually 64 bytes or 72 bytes based on if you have value or not if it's with void. Uh, and, um, you know, that is kind of okay in Azure workloads or in the cloud, like, you know, GC will collect the bytes and whatnot, but, you know, if you're on a hot path, and there are cases like that, um, it can kind of, in, in, you know, hurt your performance up to 5-10% because by inducing more GCs, right? You know, it's kind of 
overall, if you kind of hammer that, uh, hammer that, it's a, if it's a hot path that really shows up a lot, for example, I don't know, sockets, you know, when you do networking and that stuff, that actually when it matters. So we went and uh, invented something called value task, which I already hinted. It was .NET Core 2.0. Uh, it's available as well for down level, which means .NET Framework and like uh, .NET Core previous versions, even though none of them are supported anymore. Uh, and um, it's fairly simple. It has uh, basically two values. Uh, it has either holds T or it uh, holds task of T. And uh, all the methods are basically one-liners. So uh, before I jump into that, uh, you know, it can logically hold only one thing. You know, only one of those things is non-null or you know valid. Either the T and then the task has to be null, or the T is default and then the task of T is the real value. And based on that, checking just you know on the task of T checking for null, you can do basically one-liner uh, things what to do, uh, you know which one it is. You know you can quickly uh, decide. So implementation is fairly uh, fairly simple. And um, all these evator thingies and uh, that stuff that actually you know that's what allowed us to create the value task because it's task-like, it behaves like that. But because we were smart in the compiler and everything, you know, we didn't kind of require like it has to be task and everything. We had the option to actually create value task, which is a struct, which means it, you know, we will avoid actually the allocation, uh, you know, if it's the synchronous case, obviously. Now, uh, uh, if you think about that, that that's awesome. Uh, we have value task, but we already had by that time lots of functions that return task. So what do you do? You, we cannot overload on return parameter, return uh, uh, type, right? Uh, luckily, in the .NET Core 2.1, we introduced the span and memory of T. Uh, so uh, that allows us, and we had to add a bunch of overloads in, uh, uh, you know, in BCL. So what we could do is actually, when we added the you know, memory of byte uh, overload, for example, on some stream or something, we'd say, like, you know what, don't return the task, return to the value task. That's going to be a little bit faster. And, uh, uh, as a you know, nice interesting thing that sometimes you see PRs in CoreFX uh, when people pass around uh, you know byte array uh, and the PR is basically like no 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 wrap the byte array in memory stream They're like why well because it's gonna again call this overload and it's gonna use the value task and you're gonna allocate less I was like wow okay uh, thank you Stephen for you know doing that. Um, overall, I just want to caution people like value task is awesome, uh, but there's a you know, uh, basically the design guidelines is that always use with, with task, uh, start with task, sorry. Uh, don't use the value task, it's really advanced, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, the value task is really for the hot paths only, nothing else. And uh, I'm gonna show you a little bit more why. So in, uh, you know, we basically came into value task, like can we improve it even more? And uh, in future, in, in the next version, actually what we discovered that, you know, there's this kind of one person asynchronous case. So uh, most of the time you complete asynchronously and as you have seen, like everything is like on struct, so you don't allocate, life is beautiful. And but when you have to switch to the, uh, to the uh, synchronous, uh, so to the real asynchronous case, we have to allocate. Uh, that didn't stop us, uh, and in .NET Core 2.1, we actually introduced one more option, uh, the I value task source, uh, which is kind of another option on the, you know, if you saw the T and uh, task of T. Uh, and uh, one thing actually I forgot to mention, we don't have the struct of value task before, before this thingy, because um, if it's, that's for the void case, you cannot have, you know, of void, you know, in generics. Uh, we would be void, it would be task or void, so it's only task. But in the presence of I value task source, uh, you know, you have that. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into details, but it's basically, again, evator pattern almost like that. Uh, it can answer the questions like, are you completed? Uh, hook me up to a callback, get a result, and that stuff. And, uh, you know, inside, uh, all the kind of all the methods on the value task now become ternary because only one of these values can be non-null or, you know, meaningful. So you have, like, instead of, if task, uh, task of t is not, uh, null, then do this, otherwise do that. You have like one more if check in there and like uh, ternary operations. Uh, and um, what the beautiful of this thing is that actually it can, it can reuse the task, cache them, and reset them. This is something that we couldn't do because we didn't know who holds up on that. So this thing is actually enabled us even do more, uh, you know, more reusing that you allocate something, you keep it around. As soon as it's done, you can go reset that thing and use it for another uh, call later on, which is actually used heavily, for example, or heavily in uh, sockets. When you have send async or receive async, typically, or not typically, but you know, 
uh, you have one object per, per cent and one object per receive because you know uh, you cannot do two cents at the same time on the same socket. So what you can do, you have ha you actually have the guarantee that as soon as I'm done, somebody kind of uh, you know completes that, I can take that object and use it for the next call on the same uh, uh, on the same uh, socket, which is kind of pretty neat. And you get to zero allocations for sockets, kind of as the overhead. Like it's it's pretty cool. But it's exactly why. You know, we don't want people to do that, or because it's you have to be cautious. You need to know how you're calling that. You have to take care of stuff. It's kind of like bringing yourself almost to the C++ land when you have to take care of memory. You know, lifetime, not don't screw up on that stuff. So it's easy to kind of mess up in this thing, and that's why we don't recommend anyone to use it. But it's kind of cool thing that on the hot pass inside the BCL where it's most needed, that it's used. And there's like a couple of you know, high profile, like, you know, high performance libraries, uh, maybe five or 10 in the world that actually use, do use this because they get the value and it's worth for them to kind of do into the complications, uh, you know, that, uh, that are associated with it. Now, uh, it's as well used on network stream, pipelines and channels if you follow up the uh, latest thing. And um, um, that's I'm gonna leave it off and uh, do a quick summary of what we have learned hopefully today and hopefully you find it useful. So we started with the APM pattern, the asynchronous programming model from the ancient times, which was the async result, begin, foo, begin, end. And the troublesome was actually, it was limited nesting and looping that was like extremely complicated, especially in the synchronous way when you wanted to optimize things. Then was the like short period of the EAP, uh, like event-based uh, thing, which was same problems as the APM, so it didn't help for that much. Uh, the next thing that was introduced was task with the wait when you block and continue with, so anyone can hook up to task. And uh, there's the complement of the task, which is not that much known, is the task completion source, which is the thing that can manipulate with the task itself via internal methods. Uh, then async await came along. Uh, key takeaways is that actually it's awaiter pattern, so it's actually flexible. It's not based on task, but it's task-like. Uh, there are state machines involved, so behind the scenes things are rewritten for you. And in .NET Core you know, 2.0, quite recently-ish, uh, we introduced value task. We actually built on top of the abstraction in the evator pattern everywhere uh, that you know, is cool. Uh, hyper, you know, hyper optimizations are possible, but you have to be extra careful. So please don't use it. It's dangerous unless you're one of the 10 people uh, in the world that you know, really have the business need and really want to go for the pain. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Hopefully you enjoyed that.